This is Bronte. Yes. Apart from being an extremely energetic Springer Spaniel, Bronte is an important member of the New South Wales Police Force. Bronte is one of our uh, cadaver detection dogs. She's been with us uh, for five years operationally. Uh, she assists us operationally in terms of uh, locating uh, deceased and also human remains. We know that dogs can be trained to sniff out almost anything. What we haven't been able to figure out is what chemicals they're picking up on. Until now. Yes! Good dog, mate! Yeah, good girl. Ready? It's all thanks to the work going on at a well-guarded research facility just outside Sydney. This is the Body Farm, or to be more accurate, the Australian Facility for Taponomic Experimental Research. It's really rare, in fact, it's the only one outside of the US. Now, a couple of ground rules. We can't tell you where it is, for security reasons, and we're not going to show you any dead bodies. They're lying out in the ground here. A couple of reasons. You don't want to see that. And we don't want to show you that. And it's also out of respect for the dead. Let's go in. This is Professor Shari Forbes, postdoctoral research fellow Mike and Euland. Chemists, biologists, experts in forensic science. They're the living inhabitants of the body farm. Shari, how many bodies do you have here? So at the moment we have 19 bodies. Uh, nine of those are above ground, what we would call a surface deposition, and 10 of those are below ground in a range of burial scenarios. Okay. What's behind the pink tape? Uh, these are our burial scenarios, and this is a specific project involving quite a few of our partner organisations to look at the process of decomposition in a mass grave scenario. So how many bodies are buried here? We have 10 in this particular area. Uh, we have several graves. One is a shallow grave to mimic a typical forensic scenario, and the other two are deeper and involve m multiple bodies, and those would represent a mass grave scenario. So is that because bodies decompose differently when they're bunched together? This is what we're trying to find out. We don't actually know. We only ever know the outcome. We're now archaeologists are involved in human rights investigations, excavating mass graves. And so we know what we see at the end, but we don't really have a good understanding uh, of the differential decomposition, the fact that some bodies can be preserved and some can skeletonise within the same environment. There are more than a dozen experiments going on here and at the nearby animal body farm. Here, Mikan is taking a tissue sample from a pig carcass to determine if the fat cells, or lipids, are degrading in a uniform way in the hope of finding a new way of estimating time of death. Elsewhere, carcasses have been burnt this one with petrol to test how long fire detection dogs can smell accelerant at a crime scene, vital to an arson investigation. Mike, and why do you use pigs? So there's a lot of legal and ethical restrictions with the use of humans. So we use pigs as analogues because they have the same internal anatomy and they lack heavy fur. So that makes a really difference. Good. Yeah, there's just a really good substitute for us. Why are you dressing pigs? Uh, I'm looking at the degradation of the textile. So believe it or not, this pig actually had a full t-shirt that was made of cotton. It had these beautiful briefs that you can still see parts of. See the shorts? Uh, yep. It used to be black, now quite faded. Uh, and it also had socks. It's easier to see the results of this experiment back at the lab. Mike can talk me through this experiment. Uh, yeah, so we actually have three t-shirts here. So we have our pristine one that you can still tell is a t-shirt. Uh, and then we have this specimen over here. So that's a t-shirt, it was buried for a year without the presence of any remains. 
And then we have this one, also buried for a year, but it was on a pig. You actually put the T-shirt so on the pig. So I actually put it on the pig, which is fun day. Um, <laughs> and then let the pig decompose while the t-shirt was still on it. And so obviously they're in completely different conditions. Yes, so what we were seeing is that when we had them in the soil alone, the soil bacteria were just loving it. So they were breaking down the t-shirt, but when we added the body, uh, the bacteria didn't do so well. So the t-shirt was actually being preserved. What preserves it? Uh, I think it's the, the fats, so the lipids in that decomposition fluid. Uh, it sort of lays on top of the material and it just creates like a seal almost. So how does this help forensic officers? Well, it just gives us a lot more information about time since death. Because uh, people, when they do find a t-shirt in this condition, they'll say, oh, it's barely broken down. It must be quite recent. Uh, but what we see is that it's actually being preserved for a very long time. Okay, and so these have had practical, real-world use? Yeah, so the data from this trial we've actually used in a case. Uh, so we provided information to the police uh, just on how things decompose to give a better idea of time since death. But research with pigs can only take the science so far. And that leads us back to the cadaver dogs, what smells alert them to a human body? And what are their limitations? To solve that, Shari and Mikan have been collecting decomposition odour. An aluminium hood is placed over a body and the odour is pumped into a tube for analysis. This quarter of a million dollar mass spectrometer then identifies all the chemicals that make up decomposition odour. How sensitive is this machine compared to the dogs that the police use? Uh, so this is fairly sensitive. It can detect about one part per trillion. So that would be equal to a teaspoon of sugar in two Olympic sized swimming pools. So that's pretty good, uh, but it doesn't really compare to the dogs. The dogs could do the same thing, about one teaspoon of sugar in maybe six Olympic sized swimming pools. So their sensitivity is far superior to any of the instruments we have. The analysis shows hundreds of compounds, but it's thought only a handful are used by dogs. And this is one of them. The dog unit has helped Shari prove it in the field, with the results to be published soon. This research assists us to make sure that our canines uh, can identify specific target odours, uh, and especially around when we're in operationally in the field looking at uh, locating uh, human remains uh, from crime scenes. Uh, you know, being able to use that in, a, in an operational sense as well as uh, through training, uh, enhancing what we do through training and our methodology is extremely important. It may sound macabre, but there's also no shortage of donors hoping to further research like this. I confirm that this is my wish after my death to have any remains made available to the Faculty of Science at the University of Technology, Sydney. Carol Cruikshank carries a special card in her purse, carrying her wishes to be buried at the body farm. The 76-year-old likens it to being an organ donor. This is just a body the whole body instead of bits and pieces, which is probably less macabre in a way than, <laughs> than having bits, bits and pieces. I guess this just is what happens when you're in the box anyway. Exactly. That's what I don't get why people have a hard time thinking about. They'd sooner decompose in a box or get burned and their ashes all over the place, helping roses grow. I just think volunteering your body to help science or other people is the way to go. More than 300 people are already part of the donation program. They'll come here to the UTS mortuary within 24 hours of death. Less than 12 hours later, they'll be on the body farm, forwarding some truly world-leading research. We're forever indebted to the donors and to their families. We understand that it's an unusual way to donate your body to science, so perhaps even more so than medical schools, we are truly grateful of the contribution they make to our science.